Well, this is the last lecture on the advanced spectroscopic technique which we have been discussing. So, the last technique which I started discussing on is on ELS that is on electron energy loss spectroscopy and I have discussed with you the basics of ELS. Its technique is relies on the aspect that electrons when falling on the samples of any type undergoes something known as inelastic scattering. Obviously, electrons are used for electron diffraction in the electron microscopes and electron diffraction is more, mostly because of the elastic scattering in which both energy and the momentum are conserved. But in case of inelastic scattering, there is always some energy loss of the incident electron and the electron which has passed through, which has basically passed through the sample. This energy loss can be always due to certain kinds of electronic transitions happening in the material or it can be actually termed as atom electron excitations which are taking place. So, therefore, if we analyze this electrons which are basically undergone inelastic scattering, we can get informations regarding electronic structure, band structure, like bonding type and quantitatively also we can measure certain amount of element present in the material. So, first and foremost thing which I have done is that I looked at different kinds of energy losses an electron can undergo and showed you that there are different types of energy losses possible. I will go back to the this slide where I have shown you the first thing which happens is in a energy loss spectroscopy is division of the regions based on the energy. So, in case of low loss regions which is less than about 50 electron volts, we always have phonon excitations which is very small actually close to 1 eV or less than 1 eV and they are not of any significance for the measurements because the beams which are used for measurements for electron loss spectroscopy are not so much monochromatized that we can talk about the uh, energy split of about 0.5 electron volts. So, they are not resolved at all. Second important things which always happens in the low loss region is called interband or intraband transitions between the electrons. As you know the electrons moves in the orbital in the atoms. So, therefore, when an electron coming from high energy source like an electron microscope is uh, you know applies its all energy to eject certain electrons from one cell. So, that thing becomes that place become vacant and this can lead to inter or intraband transitions and this kind of things can give us a signature of the structure of the material because electronic energies are basically uh, proportional to the type of atoms or type of element it is and they actually happens in the energy range of 5 to 25 electron volts. Well, these are very important and we are going to we have already discussed about it we will discuss more. And then you have something known as high energy loss where energy losses are more than 50 electron volts and things which happens there are two things one is called plasmon excitation you know the plasmons are basically you know collective uh, oscillations of the of the electrons for the for the metals and uh, where the free electrons are large they, they, they are very strong and there can be both type of plasmons at uh, both surface plasmon or bulk plasmon one is a transverse, transverse wave other one is a longitudinal wave because these are all collective oscillations. So, therefore, there are natures wavy, wavy in nature and last thing which can happen is basically inertial ionization that means you have different cells in the atoms K, L, M, N, O, P we know that. So, inner cells which are K, L, M or K, L, M basically they contains very tightly bonded electrons and if the energy of the incoming electrons are very high this can eject an inner cell electron and this can lead to an ionization of the element and that can be used to detect an element in fact because energy levels of this electrons in the KLM cells are very well defined for different elements. So, this is uh, this actually in nutshell the yield signals and this is what I have discussed with you and that is what actually obtaining yields particular signal I will show you the yields uh, spectra yes. So, the zero loss in ill spectra corresponds to inel elastic scattering that means the electrons which are passed through 
and you know that any kind of electron microscopist will tell you that large number of electrons passes through pass through the sample. So, therefore, this particular peak in yield spectra we have very high intensity. In fact, this is the highest intensity. This is followed by plasmons. Plasmons comes in a in a in a energy range very close to the zero loss peak, and then there are characteristic peaks like elemental peaks followed by other things like we know as ELNES and EX ELFS. They are all energy loss near A structures or extended energy loss near uh, finite structures, which we will discuss now. So, uh, this uh, gives you lot of things about the electronic structure in the material. Before that, let me just go into the band structure, which we started with and uh, where I will tell you how the bands can be. Yeah. You know that yield maps can be used to get the band structure in a material. It is possible actually and this is what has been shown in the slides. It is basically electrons which are ejected from the core levels where the K element just now I discussed by the incident electron can scatter only into available states, states which are available to them. And thus the energy imparted by the incident electrons to get them basically to these transitions will reflect the density of states is as simple as that. So, ionization results in electrons which are ejected from the core states into the empty states above the Fermi levels and when that happens we can get informations of the band structure. This is why these are actually called edges not peaks because they are just onset of transitions. They are not actually taking or talking about the whole transition, they are talking about onset transition. Let me explain. Let us suppose this is what the first picture has shows. This is the empty state, then this is the another, the family level because below family level all the states are occupied, above family level states are not occupied, unoccupied and below family level you have conduction and the balance bands as you can see here. Well, now uh, let us assume that K, L, M there are three cells which are inner cells and energy levels coming out or basically suppose electrons which are ejected from K cell or M cell or L cell can basically have energies sufficient enough to travel into this conduction or valence state. In fact, it may have energy sufficient enough to cross this many cases cause this uh, you know Fermi barrier or Fermi level and enter into empty states. This is highly possible. Here I am not showing you a case of nickel oxide yield spectrum where you can see even the M cell energies of which have electrons which have actually moved inside the conduction electron balance band very close to the uh, the yields uh, very close to the Fermi energy level as uh, you know led into a peak formation here. And and so this is the M transition and this peak is correspond to those kind of states which were unfilled actually at the be, at the beginning in case of an IO uh, yield spectrum. So, that is how actually the band structure of the whole material can be obtained. This is what I can showed here, this is a plot between N E versus E as you can see here and uh, this is the Fermi level. So, these are the field state and these are the empty states and then you have basically density of states can be shown like this. So, if I if I do a certain kind of experiment like that, that means if I have electron energies more than the transition energies, okay, then it can uh, eject the electrons from the cells with sufficient high energy so that these electrons can move into these empty states, you can get something like this kind of extended structure, fine structure information in the yield spectrum. Well, that is uh, uh, you know obviously depend upon what kind of transitions you are allowing like in EDX observable leverages are directly related to the elemental cells that means we can always see K L M H S in EDS we know that, but depending on the atomic of the material also we see that. But here you can have even intra band transitions like in you know, within the M cells you have M 1, M 2 uh, through 3, M 4 or within N cell N 1, N 2, 3, N 4, N 6, 7 like that. So, these transitions are also possible, these are actually spin or orbital transitions. Now, obviously, it can also give us information about the 
energy loss nearest structures which are there which I just I have shown you in the, in the last slides. So, let us now talk about in terms of schematic pictures. This is energy band you see this is E v versus distance plot on the left side and then you see this is the Fermi level this is the valence band E v and these are actually different atoms 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and this within one uh, elect atoms these electrons are sitting in K, L, M, N, O, P, but these are the three unit cells which are shown inside or inner cells and this is the conduction band. So, the up to these field cells are there up to actually a Fermi level and they have empty states and above empty states you have valence band. So, actually in else what happens you can have an incident electron with a sufficiently high energy it can eject one of the electrons M, L, L, K in the cells and they can then move into this empty states and if they have even higher energy they can even move into the, the uh, balance bands also. Now, if I go back to the right hand side structure it will be more clear. So, they see K, L, M are the core states and they have balance bands and above that you have conduction bands and then E V is there. So, these kind of transitions from L 2 3 to even empty states can give us information regarding this part this part of the energy levels. And these are all actually called electron loss energy, electron loss near a structures or extended electron loss fine a structures. So, first one is gives you the DOS or density of states in the conduction bands. These are actually very well known and well understood now and they are used extensively. Second one it is uh, not so widely used it actually can give us information regarding chemical bonding but it is still a, a, a lot of research needs to be done to understand these electronic transitions for electron extended energy loss uh, fine scale structure. This is just like XAPS in case of X-rays. Let me give you some more things about ELNS, how it can be used as a fingerprinting. In fact, this is what is actually people do nowadays to know uh, the exactly the electronic states of a particular atom. First let us talk about titanium, titanium in three different compounds calcium titanate, titanium dioxide and Ti 2 O 3. So, in both calcium titanate Ti 2 O Ti O 2 the titanium actually has a plus 4 states and in case of Ti 2 O 3 it has plus 3 states. If I look at the ELNS spectra of titanium in all these three compounds I could see that depending on this electronic state there is distinct difference in terms of this ELNS spectra. In case of calcium titanium and titanium dioxide you have you can see 4 splits, but in case of Ti 2 O 3 there is only 2 not only that there is a shift of energy losses to the lower values for Ti 2 O 3. So, that means L 2 3's edge obtained from Ti 2 O 3 differs markedly from the tetravalent compounds like Ti O 2 or calcium titanate. Not only that in fact, one can look at differences of Ti O 2 titanium state of state of titanium in Ti O 2 from a grain and from a twist boundary. This can be done in electron microscope you can see a boundary of the twist type or tilt type. You can see the, the nature of the spectra a spectrum actually remains same for both whether titanium oxide dioxide is present in the grain inside the grain or at the twist boundary, but there is a distinct difference as far the energy levels are concerned they are not same. So, there is this little difference. So, therefore, Ti L, L 2 3 edge from the twist boundary although closely matches with the edge structure of Ti O 2 standards, but the fine structures are different. So, that is cannot be discussed within the framework of this lecture because one needs to know what is tilt boundary structure and what all things can be there a twist boundary structure. So, therefore, it can be done this is this day this particular things are taken from Seth Taylor of G Goval research and they are very important information. Well, so after giving you band structure, illness or the energy loss nearest structures let us just you know compare 
EDS with yields. There are many comparisons for EDS and yields. I will give you a chart also at the end of this lecture. You know, yields are actually much more, you know, quantitatively, qualitatively much more superior than EDS. That is what we will be taught by different books. As you have seen, number of counts and yields are very, very large as compared to EDS, first of all. And both of them function actually like a collection angle. EDX collects small angular distribution of the all emitted X rays, but yields actually elastic scattering of electrons are largely forward scattered, so therefore they are collected. And that is why if the signals are more, so therefore there will be higher quality of data. Now it can be shown here also. You have a thin specimen here, electrons are falling from the incident beam, and uh, then X rays generated by detector by the EDX detector are X ray detectors normally contains uh, this basically within a small window you can see this is the window normally contains the minus 4 to minus 2 of the emitted X rays. That means we collect very small amount of information which is generated that is the problem in EDS in TEM. That is why actually nowadays because of this problem many microscope especially the high end microscope uses several EDS detectors at least 4 within the TEM column so that the quantitative information or quantity of the X-rays which can be gathered from the samples could be very large or at least it can be increased. In case of pills, the electrons pass through the sample and we collect the solid electrons which are undergone inelastic scattering in a solid angle of pi beta square or beta is incident angle or this actually or this angle, it contains most of the energy loss electrons. So that is why yields is always preferred but you know yields requires lot of alignment of the microscope and many other things and it is costly compared to EDS that is why very few labs has EDS. Now more on illness if we want to give it but I do not want to talk much details. This is basically as I said they are all fine scale structures and they can be used for determination of the fine scale structure. Illness comes very near lower energy levels than the E, e x e l f s and e l x e wave they all talk about density of state. In fact, you can obtain a radial distribution functions also because it talks about the near element configurations uh, of the of a particular atom and therefore it is possible to obtain the radial distribution functions. So to give you some more ideas about that, you know there are two things one is important which one is to consider one is called single scattering and it is called polar scattering. When you have atoms in a you know surrounded by several atoms, suppose this black atom is surrounded by six atoms, other atoms types and this is what actually we would like to know how these atoms are distributed around the black atom. So in a fluent scattering the electron which comes like that it can come from the actually get scattered from the black atom then goes and get scattered from all the six atoms and then come out that will carry the information regarding all the surrounding atoms and that is what is actually there in electron uh, loss near structures. But on the other hand in case of ex extended in electron energy uh, fine scale structures, fine structures you have only single scattering. So one electron, once electron actually scattered from the black atom goes to the one of the surrounding atoms and then comes back. So, this is just for sake of understanding or convenience I am talking about this is all available in this books which I already referred to you. So this kind of scattering actually are reflected in the X that is why in X C E L F S you have only very small minima present but e, in case of E L N E S you have large variation of the minima or maxima. So these signals are not so strong but these signals are quite strong and fine can be can be used to determine density of states or band structures. But bonding type information which are there in the X C E L F S is not so clear it is still under investigations or this has to be done. Well after giving lot of things about the different kinds of uh, information which yields can generate we need to talk about what is the kind of resolution we can get or what is the kind of special resolution that we can get. You know nowadays costly microscope has come up with with a very nice beam fine probe stable beam but still for the best performance you need to have a very thin specimen because the more thicker is the specimen 
there will be more chance of illnesses scattering and that can mask the information which are coming out uh, from the electrons which are illnesses scattering scattered uh, you know through the sample. We also need to have electron gun of fake type that is the field emission gun because field emission guns gives you very high brightness of the beam and coherent because energy spread of the electrons in the field emission gun is very small. So, therefore, and also because high brightness, so you have a you can always have a small small probe. And uh, normally the fig has a probe size less than nowadays possible about 2 Armstrong. So, we can actually obtain resolutions of that level. This is what has been shown. Suppose you have a beam which is focused on the sample of diameter T, and then once this is uh, passed through the sample you can see the spread increases. So, therefore, resolution actually not only depend on this size, but also this size. So, that is why we need to have a finer probe. So, this size is finer, this will be also finer that is what I am saying. And in case of thermionic emission, emission like tungsten or uh, the lab 6 filaments, the probe size is what is magnitude larger. So, therefore, you cannot get kind of information which you like to get for the microscope when you are analyzing the samples. Second important which you also like to know when you are doing such a kind of investigation is the sensitivity of the ILS as opposed to EDS. You know sensitivity means if I have an element present in suppose 0 0.01 percentage can I detect. E all well said and done EDS cannot detect an elements or rather resolution of VDX actually as they say sensitivity VDX is very poor when the element percentage is as low as 0 0.01 percentage. So, the minimum detectable mass in case of uh, you know EDS is tens to hundreds of atoms, but with yields it should be very large it should be hundreds of atoms. So, that is why the yields actually is better and uh, so, it depends obviously on the microscope and sample. This is what has been shown here minimum mass function detectable weight percentage versus spatial resolution. You can see here the this is the nickel and Fe in 100 kilo volt analytical microscope, this is nickel and Fe in 30 kilo volt analytical microscope a very large probe size, but you have a detectable elevity is very small that means, that means you can detect 0 0.01 percentage of the mass, but here you can detect only 1 percentage. So, in case of copper manganese in copper actually for 120 kilo volt AEM analytic electron microscope uh, this is what is the case, but in case of FEG the, the basically you can have very small probe size and you can also have minimum mass fraction as low as less than 0.1. So, that is why we use always FEGs, FEG means for the field emission gun electron microscopes. The last thing which I am going to talk about is energy filter imaging or what is known as EFTM. As you know the electrons which are coming out from the from the sample which are inelastic scattered they contains all the chemical informations I showed you the type of element presence the the what is called amount of element present we can also do that the electronic states. So, why cannot you use this electrons to map actual image. So, that is known as energy filter imaging. Obviously, one needs to if one needs to map properly, you need to filter the electrons which are inelastic scattered depending on the energy levels. So, the, uh, I will tell you how it is possible as a time as the slides are uh, shown. So, what is done here? This is a simple uh, map of an uh, yield spectra. So, there basically the you know this is what the sample is sitting there, this is a beam screen and the energy uh, in a scattered electron passes to aperture then some alignment coils then the magnetic prism then it passes to 6 quadrupoles and 6 sextapoles follow finally, we detect them in a CC detector. So, we can actually map this electrons on the image that is what I am trying to say and that can be done as I said by energy filter. So, what can be done I actually here the change of my configuration in the microscope as you see this is the specimen this is the objective lens and there are all intermediate lens and then once these things are coming out from the intermediate lens it passes through this kind of setup which is known as sector pool lens gamma filter 
is patented by Garton Green Corporation USA and they can split the actually the inner series catalytic electrons in different energy levels, they can filter actually and then it can pass us to set of other lenses and then we can get the image. So, that means you have need to attach this part inside the column of the electron microscope to obtain this kind of energy filter imaging, that is what I am to say. So, that means extra cost basically you have to add these filters within the columns to get energy filter imaging. Let us see how uh, this is basically done, it is nothing but a contrast enhancement technique as I said, it improves the contrast in the images also diffraction patterns by removing the inelastic scatter electrons that produce the heavy background that is the first thing. It is also a mapping technique, so first thing is we can do is that we can remove the inelastic scattering unit, you can block them all of them, we can only have you know image produced by elastic scatter electrons, so that way the quality of the image or contrast of the image will be improved that is the first thing one can do. Second thing one can do is the is use the mapping, you know EDS is used as a mapping technique. So, this also can be used to create elemental maps by forming images with inner C scatter electron of particular energy levels. Also, this is an you know analytical technique, it can record your electron energy loss spectra or even maps to provide precise chemical analysis of the samples. So, that is actually in a nutshell an EFTM can do. So, first thing I will show you uh, probably the first example and uh, this, this is I think no need to show you, this is actually exactly what is done I have shown already to you. So, uh, let me skip and in a, in a energy electron magnetic spec prism is needed to separate the relative wavelengths that is what is done here, you see this is the energy loss, this is what is called scatter, inertia scatter, electric scatter, so therefore you can separate them and so therefore if I put a filter, if I just put a, if I allow only this beam which is elastic scatter and then I can basically get nice images contrast enhancing, if I only this one elastic scatter electrons then I can get uh, you know much uh, other information so, that is what I am trying to say. So, you can use a prism electromagnetic prism here extra which is nothing but a omega filter and to separate them out. In fact, one can actually take this inertia scatter electrons and then separate them out depending on energy levels that is also possible. So, let us give me one I let me give you some examples, this is taken from Rudo Gidman from Max Planck Institute Biochemy and uh, as you see here this is basically a zero loss contrast enhancement by zero loss filtering and uh, you see here once uh, this is the original image and uh, this is after the uh, you know filtering. So, you can see there is a huge change from the contrast, I do not know whether it can be seen on the skin, but at least from the image I can see this, this lot of other features have vanished and you can see even the corresponding diffraction pattern has quality has improved. So, you can always claim that using EFTM we can always create better images and diffraction patterns. To give some more information how energy filter TM can be used to produce better diffraction patterns, this is the conventional TM, we can see sticks passing through this and once you map the intensity you can see this kind of broad things and also followed by this small uh, you know peaks, but once you use energy filter TM we can enhance this small peaks. So, what you see here very clearly change of the electron diffraction pattern this brighter spots or the brighter spots are surrounded by 6 weaker spots which is not visible there. So, that is how actually you can improve the contrast of the elect electron diffraction pattern which is not possible use other. So, here we have removed all the inner secret electron by using the prism. Well, one can actually create an image using these electrons that are slowed down by the interaction of the specific elements and they are all called electron spectroscopy that is what I showed here. So, basically it is a inner secret scatter electrons which are produced image and, uh, and this is accomplished by using increasing the accelerating voltage of T m precisely by the, by the addition energy needed one can go actually uh, up to 1 lakh 100,000 EV. What is done here is simple like this, this is the global imaging setup, so, this is what is the quadrupole gamma filter, omega filter. So, you have a specimen electron energy comes energy loss and then it passes through that and then you can basically have a elastic scatter electron, elastic scatter electron is basically without slit. So, if you use a slit you can separate them out 
nicely. This is what is actually done in omega filters and uh, one can use different kinds of filters there is no need of showing that the Gatron has different filters, Leo Hulse also have filters different components are making different filters. Last things uh, which I am going to show you is called stamils, stamils in the sense that it can be used to uh, you know determine the particular atom present in a high resolution or microscopy actually. What is done is let me tell you that, so suppose this is the atomic arrangement of certain uh, you know certain compound or elements or let us say compound here because there are different colors atoms. So, you have an electron falling onto that and then each atom has different scattering power right that depends on the atomic electronic configurations. So, depending on the scattering power electrons uh, they will get scattered at different angles. Now, if we apply an annular detector like this, this is annular this is a central hole is like this central hole and this is a detector. So, if I have annular detector I can collect the electrons coming scatter electrons coming at different angles from the incident beam this, this or this or this like that which is scatter after it passes to the sample the rest of the sample is here. And once I correct that and I know that different atoms different atoms have different scattering power. So, therefore, I can actually image the, the atoms in highly single microscope. At the same time, if I take yields from each of these atoms atomically you know I can detect what atom is present. So, therefore, by using together STM and yields one can actually determine the atoms in the highly single electron microscope which is not possible so far, but with the advent of you know new kind of contrast magazine like in Titan this has become obsolete because in Titan you can, you can get contrast from even each atom differently you do not need to actually do the stem. So, I will give you some example of EFTM this is just the different layers in a thin multi layer thin film. So, you can see the contrast here is different than the contrast here. So, you can actually see this is graded silicon germanium multi layers not SI layer between them they are only two multi layer mono layers single molar detection is very easy. So, you can see single molar these are high resolution images you can see when the atomic planes and rapid acquisition also possible. So, you can quantify that this is again taken from my own our own work this is basically I have shown you at the beginning of the this this course when you deposit copper using pulse electro deposition techniques we always use thyorea and thyorea has many roles to play it can control the nucleation mechanism for the thin film deposition it can control the growth also it is postulated that thyorea contains lot of sulfur and sulfur gets collected at the gain boundaries of the grains this is a grain copper grain nanocrystalline you can say approximately about 50 40 to 50 nanometers. And once they are collected around the grain that it will represent the gain boundaries and this sulfur atoms then can pin the gain boundaries for further growth. So, therefore, thyorea can act as a gain you know inhibitor gain growth inhibitor and that can be probed using energy filter imaging. So, if I use sulfur energy edge that means, if I only allow the energy loss due to sulfur atoms in the yield spectra and then I will image that onto the onto the image. So, I can see that all these gain boundaries are getting brighten up you can see here you can see there. So, you can see there. So, that means indeed sulfur atoms are present at the gain boundaries. So, that means our postulation that thyorea act as a gain growth inhibitor can be proved by this way. This is now published and general uh, this is now published in uh, the uh, in the reputed journal. So, one can actually look at details, but it is possible to take up certain kind of issue and then do the energy filter imaging and to show that these are actually true. Well, one can also actually do much better things. If you this is again taken from our my own work or our own examples, these are actually nanoparticles created when you leach aluminum, nickel, cobalt, quasi crystals. So, they create this kind of you know blocky crystals, and you can see they are actually nickel cobalt FCC, and you know nickel cobalt has almost you know atomic numbers very nearby. So, it is very difficult to say that nickel or cobalt present 
in the in these particles by EDX analysis. So, only way we can show is by using EFTM mapping. So, you can see here this is a big size particles even more than 100 nanometers quite close to about 250 nanometers. You can map nickel and cobalt in this and if you look at carefully the nickel is much less in this particles than cobalt because cobalt map shows much brighter regions than the nickel map. And if I do it using a function of size suppose if you go to intermediate size you can see still nickel quantity is less than the cobalt in those particles if you do the nickel and cobalt map. These are impossible in EDX actually you cannot do that because they are atom and nickel and cobalt atomic numbers are uh, nearby. If you go to very small particles you can see suppose look at this one nickel and cobalt distribution is almost uniform. You may ask me what is the need of doing this? Well, as you know these small particles which are actually alloys of nickel and cobalt nanoparticle they are used as a catalyst. So, catalytic behavior of those particles will depend upon the elemental distribution and also the atomic uh, electronic structure. So, by using yields one can actually obtain all kinds of informations and then use it to understand the catalytic behavior of this. This is what is our aim also to do that, but I am showing a part of the work. So, by this way we can actually go down to very small particles which is actually uh, approximately about 40 nanometers and do mapping nickel and cobalt this is not so good, but still you can see cobalt is almost as quantity is almost same as, as the nickel. So, by this way we can actually do all kinds of analysis. So, as I said sometime in the lecture that I will totally tell you detailed comparison of the yields and EDS. Well, yields has higher spatial resolution as EDX, EDX may be affected by background scattering, yields has a higher energy resolution than EDX around 1 electron volts, yields is better in detecting lighter elements than EDS, EDS can be used to detect elements which are uh, atomic number less than carbon or C6, yields contains information of electronic structure which does EDS does not contain, EDS is easy to operate that is why everybody uses and quick for qualitative analysis. However, yield spectra from thick specimens may be difficult to intermediate because of the Pugel scattering which I have shown you. Interpretation of fine structure sometimes requires software lot of sophisticated calculations which I could not show you because of the time constant. So, with this I, I conclude this lecture. The next lecture I am going to start with the surface uh, characterization techniques mostly XPS and uh, XPS and the OGR spectroscopy and move on.